What's up guys? Hey, it's Clint Kunz here. And in this video, I wanted to break down what is the difference between a standard will and a revocable living trust. Okay, let's get started. All right, so here's the thing. Everyone knows what a will is. If you've had any loved one that's passed away, odds are that they had a will. In fact, I put 100% on that they had a will, unless they didn't create any type of estate plan and they died what's called intestate. And then the government took, took over and determined how the assets were gonna be distributed. So what is it about these two estate planning tools that tends to cause so much confusion when it comes to setting up an estate? Well, I think a lot of it is with the legal profession itself, is that there's so much money wrapped up in the probate process that most individuals are convinced or told, um, or there's you know just marketing out there that the will is the way to go for most people. That unless you have a huge estate, you shouldn't consider any other options. Well, see, this is where the misconception lies and where the mistake is in most people when it comes to planning their estate is that they buy into this. Now, I know this from, of course, firsthand experience being an attorney, but my grandfather was an attorney. And in his practice, it was comprised of estate planning, which was predominantly will-based, okay, and then a few other little things as well. And how did that work out for him? Well, when it comes to wills, the things that make it so attractive for attorneys to set up a will versus a living trust, and, and I'll explain these as I go along, all right, is that in a will, you have to go through probate, all right? With a living trust, there's no probate. Now, what is probate? Well, a lot of people think that if I put everything down in, in a will or, you know, when I pass away, I'm going to leave everything to my wife and then she has a will and she says when she, she passes away, she's going to leave it to her two kids. That if you have that set of instructions, when you pass on, then you can just move your assets to those beneficiaries. But in point of fact, you can't because when you pass away, any assets that are titled in your individual name, say it's a house, vehicle, bank account, stock account, in order to transfer those assets to another part person, a beneficiary, you have to open a probate. Because when you open the probate, you receive what are referred to as letters of testamentary, which means it gives the executor of your estate the power now to transfer assets to whoever the beneficiaries are under that will. And so when I open up a probate, the court will give me letters of testamentary. Maybe I get 30 of them because my client happened to have a lot of titable assets. And then when I contact a financial institution, they're gonna say, give us your letters of testamentary so we know that you have the power by the court to move this asset. Now, here's where the play comes in for attorneys, meaning the financial play. When they set up a will, every will must go through probate. Well, who's gonna be handling that probate? Are, it's going to be your executor. Okay, so this is my executor. That is the person appointed uh, under the will to handle the probate. And it's going to be the attorney that the executor hires to assist with that process. This, what does all this mean right here? Money to both of these parties. So when you open up a probate, the attorney is going to charge. Now, depending on where you live, uh, probate fees can be a percentage of the estate. So in California, it can be as high as 4% of the gross value of the estate. So if you have a, an estate that's valued at $5 million with $3 million in debt on it, what's 4% of $5 million? It's $200,000. So this is how much the attorney can charge to probate the estate. And let's say that $5 million with the $3 million in debt, it's comprised of one house and one bank account, two assets. That's all you got to probate. How long could that take? I mean, if you wanted, didn't want to drag your feet, hmm, less than six months, and you can charge $200,000 for that service because in California, you're allowed to charge a percentage. Now, other states, they have what are called, I'm going to use some air quotes, reasonable attorney's fees. Now, as an attorney, I know that my fees are reasonable. Why? Because I see that myself as a reasonable person. Therefore, whatever fee I set, it's got to be reasonable. But I guarantee you a lot of sometimes there are people who say, I don't think that's reasonable. But it's not about you, it's about me. So I can charge my reasonable fee to probate in the state. This is what my grandfather used to do. He would charge his reasonable fee to handle the probate. And so on average, a probate will, will generate for attorney minimum 6K 
average is probably going to be about $20,000 to handle a probate. So the idea here in drafting wills is we want to get as many people as we can into this funnel because that's truly what it is. Probate is a marketing funnel for attorneys. They bring in a lot of people into the process and they can get creative with how they handle their, their estate plans or with the wills that they draft. And what do I mean by that? When they draft your will, they don't give you the original. They tell you, hey, I'm gonna hold on to your original for safekeeping, you just get a copy. And you think, oh, I can't believe this. You're gonna do this for free? Yeah, no problem. Well, why are they doing that? So when you pass away, your family pulls out the will and they look at the will and guess whose name is down here in the bottom? Well, yeah, the person that passed away, but also the law firm's name and address and phone number, how to contact them. So this family member now will go to the attorney requesting the original. The attorney now has that client coming back in. They pick up the probate and then they start making the money from there. In fact, when my grandfather sold his practice, he had all these wills he'd created. People were still alive in a fire safe file cabinet. He sold that to his associate attorney. He said, hey, there's 300 wills here. We get a return on that of about 75% and the average estate is 20K. Well, we'll do some numbers and we'll come up with what it's gonna cost for you to buy this practice. So probate is a great way for attorneys to make money. Now, I don't want you to think that probate is all bad. It's all about financials because there is one benefit to going through the probate process. And that is when you file a will for probate, it's public notice. You're putting the world on notice that this person has passed away. And more importantly, what you're putting the world on notice about is your creditors. So you publish notice in a newspaper. You say, John has passed away. A probate's been opened in uh, King County Superior Court. And if you have any claims, you need to submit those claims. If you don't do it within a period of time, six months, then you're forever barred. So one benefit of probate is it stops creditors from coming out of the woodwork two years later and saying, hey, your parents owed me $500,000 they never paid. Here's the promissory note. I just found out that they died and you owe me money. Well, if you open to probate, they're barred and they cannot seek recovery there because all you do, and typically what people do is they publish notice in an obscure trade journal and that's all they have to do and they've met the statutory process for probate. So that is one benefit. But this cost factor is what gets a lot of people. Now, the other thing about probate is that it's a public record. All right, so you've probably seen real estate investors uh, tell you, hey, you know, probate is a great way to buy property. What do they do? They monitor people that have passed away through the probate filings. They find out that the beneficiaries don't live in that state. Then they start making offers to buy the real estate to save them the time and hassle of having to deal with that remotely. So that's, that's that probate strategy from an investor standpoint. Why is that? Because it's a public record. So your will, what you own, all that's available to the public when you pass away, when you go through the probate process. Now, a living trust does not go through that process. With a living trust, when you pass away, hopefully what you've done is you've placed all your assets under the trust name. So all your assets are in the name of your trust. That means you've changed title on them. As long as they're not in your individual name, you don't have to go through probate. But occasionally everyone screws up and we leave something out of our trust. That's why most living trusts will have in the estate plan what's called a pour over will. And a pour over will is simply a will that says, hey, I forgot to transfer all my assets into the trust. Whatever you figure out that I screwed up on, you still gotta go through the probate process, but it's gonna end up here for my overall estate distribution. <clears throat> so the main difference between a will and a living trust when it comes to planning is that a will has to go through probate, a living trust does not. Now keep in mind, what did I tell you one of the benefits of the will was is that it stops creditors. So on the living trust side, since you don't open a probate, you're not forestalling any creditors from coming back two years later and demanding money. So many times what we'll do as a strategy here is that when we create a living trust for a client, when someone's passed away, we will open up a small probate. No assets really, just open up a probate to publish notice to prevent any creditors from coming back against the estate. So that's uh, from the probate side. Now, what other benefits do we have here with the will versus living trust? It's in the, how they're set up. Now, one of the things about the, the will that you find many times is I call them simple, right? That we set up the will so that they're gonna, all the assets will be distributed to this individual when I pass away or to these kids gonna be split evenly. 
and there's not a lot of thought put into how we want those assets to go to them. And the problem with the simple strategy, let's say that, you know, it goes from you down to these three kids here. Well, what happens if this child right here is in the midst of a divorce from this person right here who's none too happy about this whole proceedings and they're suing this child? Well, all of a sudden they receive $800,000. What is this person going to do? They're going to go from that to that. Oh, I'm much happier now. Look at all that extra money that we just found. So probate, when you use a will and you go through the probate process, if it's a simple will and you're just distributing the assets outright to your beneficiaries, the issues you could face is that, hey, maybe an ex-spouse is going to take part of that estate. Or maybe this person right here is being sued um, because of some of their real estate investments now. So attorneys coming after them, they're going to be able to go after and possibly seize those assets. So the simple will is not the preferred way of handling it. With a living trust, what you'll do typically is you have more flexibility. It's automatically built into it that when you're making your distributions, you can choose to set it up that when I pass, <clears throat> my assets that come down to my kids here, they're going to come down in their own separate trusts. I'm not going to give it to them outright. I'm going to move it into a trust for each of them, and that's going to determine when they receive the funds. So I can put in there things like, hey, if you're involved in a divorce, you're not getting any money. Or if you're involved in a lawsuit, you're not getting any money until that's all settled. So it protects the assets up here from whatever's happening down here. Until this area is freed up and these people are no longer in that scenario, you can keep the assets in stasis. Whereas over here, you can give the creditors access to those potential assets if you make it a simple will. Now, many attorneys will tell you, hey, whatever you do in a living trust, we can do in a will. And they're 100% accurate when they tell you that because you can actually set up a will that does something similar to what I just showed you here. So what you end up doing is you start with your will right here. So I've got my will. It goes through probate. So I send it through that big old grinder mix and give the attorney $75,000 and I give the executor $25,000, which is a key point here. Whenever you're putting together an estate plan, I always do it in the living trust. Make sure you say, hey, my, whoever's serving as my trustee of my living trust when I'm no longer here, that's like the executor of the will, you're only entitled to so much compensation. The last thing you want to do is get somebody in there that's administering your estate and they think, heck, I'm going to drag this out for a long period of time because I'm, I'm making money off this. So the way you prevent someone from dragging it out is you limit how much money they can make. You can only collect $2,000 a year not to exceed $6,000 for handling this estate right then and there. Or you can put it in, you get paid nothing. You do it out of love and affection for your family. So the, the issues that come down here, uh, what I was going back to is that you can set up your will, it goes through the probate grinder, comes through here, and then when, it, when this gets all spit out, then it gets spit out into three separate trusts that looks like this right here. In fact, it operates the exact same way. These are called testamentary trusts. And so that is one of the biggest jokes that I find in the industry that people utilize against unsuspecting individuals as they tell you, oh yeah, we got your trust. It's going to come through your will. Okay. So what you're telling me is this, you're going to charge me to create my will. You're going to charge me to probate my assets and then you're going to charge me to set up trust. This is the ultimate triple play for someone because you're going to get build, build and build all along the way here. Yeah, you can create the trust, but it has to go through the probate process first in order to get to the trust. Wouldn't it be simpler to do it this way? Start with your living trust, fund your living trust, and then you can create the sub-trust out of this one trust, and you're not going to get billed multiple times because all this is baked in to the initial structure. So when you're considering a living trust versus a will, the things you got to be looking at when you go with a will, you're guaranteed there's going to be attorney involvement, there's going to be uh, the probate process that you have to go through, and depending on how you create your will, you may have issues with your beneficiaries receiving their assets. You got to be careful about the executor on what they're going to do. Whereas the living trust, you can nail all these things down. It's by default. You say, hey, I don't, I'm not going to go through the probate process. I'm going to keep it fully funded. My trustee is going to administer it. They're not going to receive any funds for it. And then it's going to be distributed to my kids in the following manner. And yeah, it's going to be held. So if they're getting sued or they're involved in a divorce, they're not going to get any assets. So that's just a high level of the differences between these two assets. 
uh, or, or options to plan for your estate, you're probably wondering, again, when do we consider one versus the other? Here's what I tell people. If you have no titable assets, or better yet, no real estate, okay? Uh, no kids that you like um, they, that are set up there. Then I would look at a will, all right? Because you could have bank accounts in, um, and if you want to distribute the assets outright, you can do payable on death and you can completely avoid the probate process. But if you have real estate, if you have minor children, okay? Great for a living trust. It'll control who, how the uh, minor children are going to receive money when you're no longer here. The person that takes care of them, what type of funds you can build into their, hey, yeah, you're, I want uh, this couple to take our two kids, but we realize that they may need to put a little more into their house, so we'll give them $100,000 to expand their house because I don't want my kids sleeping in the closet. Um, I've done all kinds of different things before with this. So if you have minor killed children, you have real estate, you want more control uh, when you've passed on to make sure the assets are preserved for, for those individuals, definitely I would go with the living trust. I, it does, value does not matter to me. That's not a concern. It's about, do you want your wishes carried out? And you want to ensure that when you're no longer here, that all of this stuff is being preserved for your beneficiaries. And you're going to want to go with the living trust. Guys, I hope this made some sense for you. If you've been having those questions about the difference between a will versus a living trust, and there are many more differences as well that I didn't have time to go into that are more nuanced. But I can just tell you, this is the preferred method when it comes to planning for an estate. All right, guys, take care.